Last night we were praying with our family and I said, what were we doing last Saturday? And I was like, we were in North Carolina. We were gone, but that felt like forever ago. Um, But no matter what, this is our first Sunday of 2024. And we wanted to kick off this part of the service by celebrating 2023. And can I tell you that God did some amazing and incredible things at West Florida Baptist Church in 2023. Yes, praise the Lord for that this morning. It is good and it is healthy to take time to pause and reflect. Because if we don't look back, then sometimes we just get so caught up in life that we forget to give God the praise and the glory for who he is and what he has been doing. And I love watching all of those uh, recap videos. And man, we had some huge things last year. Easter Sunday, we had a record attendance, well over 900 people here in the two morning services that we had. We had an incredible month of December. God was moving and working and doing awesome things. We got to serve our community through the 5K. And did you guys notice the um, trunk or treat? 2,500 people on our property. To God be the glory. That was an awesome weekend. Uh, Last year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. Will you praise the Lord for that? 50 years of God's faithfulness. We cannot browse over that and take that lightly. I mean, we had some great times looking to the past and just, again, celebrating all that God had done and all that he's been doing. But here's some of my favorite numbers. We saw a record number, 67 people follow the Lord in baptism. Praise the Lord for that this morning, 67. Internally, um, I was praying for 52 at the start of the year, and I challenged our staff, and we never really announced that or made that big of a deal about it, but God exceeded even our expectations there, and we're praying for 100 this year to follow the Lord in baptism, and we have a baptism Sunday next week, and so God is doing a work in hearts and lives, and to him be all the glory for that. A um, couple other exciting numbers, too, that I just wanted to point out. We had over 65 new families join our church last year, 65. I run into people all the time that are saying, man, there's so many people at our church, I don't even know all of them. Well, number one, if you don't know somebody that's sitting around you, say hi to them before you leave, get to know them, ask them their names, but it is absolutely incredible, the people that God has been sending our way. And then just one more number real quick. We went from, we grew from an average attendance on Sunday mornings of 501 people to 591 last year. So a growth of 90 people on average. And I say all that to say that 2023 was awesome because God allowed our influence to grow and expand in the lives of people. Those aren't just numbers. Every single number is a person. It's an individual. And you know what our mission is as a church? Our mission is to love God and... Y'all are good. Let's do that again, though. Our mission is to love God and... And as long as we exist as a church, our responsibility is to continue to go after people and reach people and point them to Jesus and the amazing salvation that we've been singing about this morning and to who God is and what he is all about. That is our job and our responsibility. So you know what 2024 is all about? You know what year number 51 is all about for our church? Everybody say it right here. What are these two words? Never stop. That's exactly right. Now, you might be sitting there saying, all right, you're that guy that's annoying that we're just trying to catch our breath from 2023, and you're going to say, never stop, keep on going, and that's exactly right. Yes, we only have one life to live, right? And the Lord's coming back, and we need to be busy about his work because we don't know how many days we have. We don't know how many days are promised, and we must be found faithful. And so the first thing that I want to challenge you about this morning before we dive into our new sermon series and into our message is to get involved. I know the the beginning of the year is often about making New Year's resolutions and making goals, and I think that that's good. Well, one of the biggest goals that you can do is you can make a decision to get involved in our church. We've had a lot of growth, and if we're going to continue to grow, we need your help. 
It's the servants, it's, it's you all as individuals that make the difference, that make this church the special place that it is. And I want to challenge you at the start of 2024, if you're not involved, take the next step and get involved. And if you are serving, ask God to reignite and give you a new passion and, and keep being involved and dive in wholeheartedly even more so in this upcoming year. And to help you all with that, tonight we are going to have our first ever that we've tried serve group open house, okay? So tonight at five o'clock, instead of our connection groups, what we'd like to do is in, to invite all of you to come back. And at 5 p.m., you are gonna come here into the auditorium. We're gonna give you some basic instructions and then you are gonna have the opportunity to go and listen to the, uh, a serve group leader, a group that you may be interested in serving in. And they're gonna explain their ministry and what it's all about and their burden for it. And then you're gonna have an opportunity to get signed up and get more information and to be able to get plugged in. Now take a look at all of these different areas where you can be involved. There's a lot of things up there. One, one of the things I wanna point out is children's ministry. Have you all noticed all the kids that we have around here? That is a blessing. It is absolutely phenomenal and awesome. And you know what? We, we could use a lot of help in our, our children's ministry. Another one that I just want to point out is all the way on the other side is media. How many of you traveled over the Christmas holidays? How many of you tuned in to our live stream and different things like that? Or you have at some point when you've been sick Man, we were traveling last week. We got to catch the whole service. We heard Pastor Shetler's message on um, spiritual discernment. Awesome message. It was powerful. They're doing an incredible job with that. But you know what? We need, we need help. We need people to get plugged in. That's something that I don't want to say almost anybody can do, but that is. There's lots of areas that you can serve. First impressions. We have an addiction recovery program. The point is this. There is a place for every single person here to be involved and we need your help and we want you to be involved because God is doing a work and when you take that next step and get involved in serving, I promise you God will bless you and God will grow you in incredible ways. So tonight at what time? 5 p.m. Serve Group Open House. I wanna challenge you and encourage you to be here tonight. All right, and now we're gonna jump into the message for today. And by the way, uh, Logan, I don't know if you can do anything, but there is a weird echo. I don't know if it's coming from one of these things, but it's kind of popping up here on the stage in particular. So if you can do anything about that, that would be greatly appreciated. All right, our new sermon series. We are in Romans chapter 9, and we are jumping into Let There Be Light. We're going to be looking at Romans 9 through 11, and we're going to be talking and challenging you to plug in to God's plan for salvation. Now, just to catch you up to speed, to put this all into context, Paul just finished writing and penning through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8. By the way, Romans chapter 8 was an awesome passage to preach through at Christmas. I, I had a good time opening up all those gifts and all of those presents because that's what Romans 8 was about. It was about experiencing Christ and all his amazing gifts. Man, and in Romans chapter 8, we talked about the fact that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We talked about the fact that we are adopted into his family. We are the children of God. And we're not just his children. We're joint heirs with Jesus. Everything that Jesus is going to inherit, we get to inherit. Man, we talked about the fact that we live in a broken world. And in this world, there will be suffering. But in the midst of the suffering, we know that all things will work together for good to them who love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. And then we talked about the fact that we aren't just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. If you're on God's side, it is impossible for you to ever lose, not only in this life, but in the world that is to come. And then he ends on the pinnacle, on the peak of it all. Nothing, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you can tell Paul was a preacher because he threw out every adjective that you could possibly think of to prove that point right there. And that's how he ends Romans chapter 8. So you, you put your pen down or you, you pause and you take a break. Where do you go? Where do you go from there? You go to Romans chapter 9. Think about this. You go from the joyful emotion of all that you are and all that you have in Christ to the heavy burden for those who do not have what you have. 
We're going to jump into that here in just a minute. But let there be light. Plug into God's plan for salvation. When you're on that mountain peak and you're enjoying all of those blessings and all of the securities and all of the promises that God has for us, don't forget about the whole world, the, the, a lot of the people that are around you that don't have the same things that you and I have and that we experience in Christ. You know what Romans 9 through 11, it is an in-depth, magnificent study on God's plan for salvation and what it always has been. And that's what we're going to be diving into. So are you ready? All right, are you ready? Here we go. <laughs> Let's dive right in. Here's the first thing I want us to look at this morning. A heavy burden. A heavy burden. Look at verses 1 through 3. It says here, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. And think about verse 2. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Now again, the backdrop of Romans 8, I mean, you're going from one extreme to the other. I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. And why? He explains in verse 3, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. Paul's saying, I wish that, that I would be accursed, that I would be the one that is cut off from Christ. For my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, there is a heavy burden that Paul is dealing with here. Now, some more background to bring us up to speed. Do you understand that, that Paul was considered a traitor by the Jewish people? A traitor by the Jewish people. And understandably so. Paul was a leader of leaders. Paul was so, so zealous in his faith and in his belief that Jesus Christ was not the Messiah. That he was a blasphemer. That he was a liar. That he was willing to go to the extreme of having all of his disciples and his followers be put to death. When Stephen was stoned in Acts, they took his clothes and they cast them at the feet of the Apostle Paul himself. Now all of a sudden, Paul's on the other side. He's completely flipped the script and he's gone all the way to the other extreme. This is a big deal. When you think of um, great traitors in history... Who's the first person that comes to your mind when you think of an American traitor? The greatest traitor in American history. Do you all know his name? What is it? There you go. Okay, Benedict Arnold. I, I pulled uh, my son out last night and I asked him because I was like, do we still, does everybody still associate being a traitor with Benedict Arnold? And yes, it's still being taught in history classes and things like that. Yes. I mean, just put it up to, on par to the Jewish people. That's, that's what Paul did. He went from one team to the other team. And he went from being a general on this side to being a general on the other side. And he's making a profound difference. And on top of that, it even feels like the Jews are his enemy. This is all in context. Romans 9 through 11 fits perfectly with everything that Paul's trying to do and accomplish here in the book of Romans. Way back in chapter 2, he told the Jewish people that there was no benefit to them being born a Jew and to them being circumcised. He's, he's attacking hard, but he goes further than that. He tells them that the name of God is being blasphemed among the Gentiles because of them. He tells them that they are reaping up wrath for the day of judgment. God's chosen people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders. He's looking at them in the face and he's saying, guess what? You are storing up wrath. You're not right with God. And then to top it all off, <laughs> the kicker of all kickers. He told them that the Gentiles who believed in Jesus were more Jewish than the people that were born Jews. You want to talk about throwing fuel on the fire? That's what he's doing, man. He's dumping all the gasoline and tossing the match right on top of it. But here's the reality. These aren't just fighting words. This is the truth. Even God's chosen people. If they do not believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they are accursed. They are the enemies of Christ. Hamish was just talking about that. Man, we started this morning taking time to, to thank God because we were once his enemies. But because of the cross and because he died for our sins, we are now seated at his table and everything has changed. Something huge 
is at stake here. How in the world is it possible that God's chosen people could be his enemies? How is that possible? And not only that, if that's the case, did God fail to keep his word? Did God fail to keep his promises to Israel, especially in light of the fact with the gospel, he sets aside the nation of Israel for a time and he replaces them with the church, with the true believers in Jesus Christ. Was he unfaithful? This is a huge question. It has to be answered because here's the reality. If God was unfaithful to his chosen people, the Jewish people, then how in the world can we be certain and confident that all of those promises that we just talked about in Romans chapter 8 aren't just words? How do we know that God's going to keep his promises? Does God fail to keep his word? And all God's people answer that question with an emphatic, no. (laughs) We know that God is faithful to his word. Paul knows that God is faithful to his word. And that's why he begins this chapter with a huge and heavy burden. Paul loved his people. Paul loved being a Jew. He embraced the fact that he was one of God's chosen people. Paul said of himself, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. This is why there is a great heaviness and a continual sorrow because his burden and his desire is that his People come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Here's the first practical application. Feel it. Before we go any further, before we dive into this passage, we've got to feel the burden. We shouldn't look to Paul and say, that's good for you to have that, but not good for us. No, we need to have that same exact burden, and we need to feel the same continual heaviness and great sorrow that that Paul felt. You realize what he said? In verse 3, he said, I could wish that I myself were accursed for Christ's sake, uh, accursed from Christ for my brethren. He wishes that he could take their penalty. He wishes that he himself could be cut off from Christ. He was willing to go to hell so that his Jewish people, his brethren, his brothers and sisters, his kinsmen could come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's what a burden for people looks like. I don't know about you, that, that's, a, that's a huge thing to say. That's a dramatic thing to say, and I thank God In his marvelous, um, in the way that he created things and in in his perfect plan, there's no way that we can ever be separated from Christ. That's not possible. Paul can't possibly go to hell for the sake of his brethren, but he, he would have if he could have. Do we love others with a great heaviness and a continual sorrow over the fact that they are lost. Do we understand here today that, that we're not just talking about frivolous things? We're not just here just singing words about God's amazing grace. And we're not just singing words about once being his enemies. Do you realize that outside of these doors and maybe even inside of these doors, there may be people here today that are cut off, that have never put their faith and trust in Jesus. And when they breathe their last breath and when they step into eternity, they're gonna stand before the judge of all judge and you're either gonna go to eternity in heaven or we're gonna go to an eternity in hell, cut off and separated from God forever. That means that right now you have neighbors that are lost and don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That means right now that more than likely you have family members that are lost and don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. My aunt just this past week, 75 years old, was perfect, perfectly fine health. She was at my other aunt's house and they were celebrating the holidays and she went to bed and she did not wake up the next morning. Just like that. And I'm reminded of how desperately people even in my family need Christ. But when was the last time? When was the last time I wept over somebody that needed to be saved? 
When was the last time that I, I got on my knees and I dedicated myself to hours or just, to, just even having the burden for a neighbor or a coworker or somebody that God's placed in my life that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because we're talking about heaven and we're talking about hell and we're talking about eternity and this is real, folks. That's why Paul goes from the mountaintop of Romans chapter eight and all that we have and all that we are and the realization that there's others other people that we love, other people that we're close to that don't have it and that aren't experiencing it. What are you willing to do about it? Next week, Sunday night, all of our connection groups are, are coming back and we're going to do a series. It's called The Three Circles. It's a six-week series. All of our connection groups are going to do it because it ties in perfectly with where we're at here in Romans chapter 9 through 11. And the whole series is about taking everyday conversations and turning them into gospel conversations because that's why we have been left here in this world. The world needs Jesus. We are his hands and feet. We take the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to the lost world. And we need to be burdened and equipped and doing what he's left us here in this world to do. But not only was there a heavy burden, there's also an unfathomable rejection. Look at verse 4. Paul's talking about his brethren, his kinsmen. And he says in verse 4, who are Israelites? Israelites, let there be light. We're talking about let there be light. Okay, look at all that God gave Israel. We're, we're going to talk about some things here real quick. And I want you to think about all that God gave Israel for the purpose of using Israel to show the world who he was. All right, so Paul brings this all into perspective. These are my brethren. These are my kinsmen. They are Israelites. He says, to whom pertaineth the adoption? Israel was adopted by God. He chose them. Out of all of the other people and all of the other races in the world, he specifically chose them as the vehicle that he was going to use to show the world who he was. And then he says, and the glory. <laughs> he gave them his glory when they left Egypt. Remember when they got out of the wilderness, there was a, a pillar of fire by night. There was a cloud by day. They got to Mount Sinai. God himself descended in a very real and dramatic way. Earthquakes, thunderings, fire, all kinds of stuff like that. And he gave them the Ten Commandments. And then they built a tabernacle. And later they built a temple. And when they dedicated to the Lord, the presence of God, the glory of God himself descended and God himself dwelt among his people. Wow. It says, and the covenants is what it says next. To him pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants. He made a promise to Abraham. He reiterated it to Isaac and to Jacob. He then reiterated it again to Moses. He gave David a different uh, promise. He said, I'm going to establish a king from your seed that's going to rule on your throne forever. And that king was Jesus Christ. He gave them some incredible covenants and the giving of the law. The law was wonderful. Man, we talk about the law often in the New Testament in a negative light, but that's because the law can't save us. But that doesn't mean that the law wasn't glorious in the sense that it showed us our need of our Savior. It was our schoolmaster that brought us to Christ. And then it says, and the service of God. He gave them the ministry of the tabernacle and the temples. They got to serve in the sacrificial system and all of the different feasts and ordinances that all specifically pointed to the greatest sacrifice that was going to come one day, Jesus Christ himself. And then he says, and the promises. And the promises. No greater promise than this. I will be your God and you will be my people. You want to talk about some incredible promises that were given by God. I will be your God and you will be my people. Then look what he says in verse 5. Whose are the fathers? Man, all of our spiritual fathers, they were the fathers of the Jews, the Israelites. Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Jacob. They were all the children of Israel. And then it says, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. You want to talk about the greatest blessing that he ever gave to the nation of Israel? It was when he fulfilled his promise by sending his only begotten son in the flesh. And guess what Israel did with him? They rejected him. Look at verse 6. He says this at the beginning. Let's all read this out loud with me, okay? Help me out here at the beginning. Just the first line of verse 6, the first sentence. What's it say right there? Everybody out loud together. 
not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. You know what Paul's saying? My brethren are accursed. God's chosen people are accursed, but it's not because God's word has failed. That's what he's saying. It's because Israel failed. God sent his Messiah. He sent God in the flesh. And when he was right smack dab in front of him, they didn't know him. And they rejected him. And they crucified him. Because they failed to see what God was trying to show them all along. Was that there was nothing great or nothing special about them. God chose them in spite of them. They needed a savior just like everybody else in the world needed a savior. And it was an unfathomable rejection because no matter how God revealed himself and showed himself, they were blinded to it. So here's a practical application. Understand God's plan. Understand God's plan. Last week, Pastor Shetler was here, and he talked about spiritual discernment. How many of you were here and heard that message last week? If you did not, go back on YouTube and check it out and listen to it. It's a powerful message. I love how he started in Hebrews Chapter 5, I want to challenge our church in the same way again today. We as believers, we don't need to not grow. We don't need to just constantly need the milk of God's word like a bunch of babies, okay? It would look really crazy if someone who's 15 is still acting like a baby. As believers, that's how many of us are. We've been saved for years, but we don't grow always the way that we should. It's time that we can handle the meat of God's word so that we can be skillful in handling the word of righteousness. If we're talking about people being lost, then we need to be skillful in what God's word says about salvation. We need to know it. We need to know it as as best as we as human beings can. We need to soak it up. So I want to challenge you here. We're talking about salvation, and on the surface, I'm going to give you two points about understanding God's plan that are going to sound really simple. You've heard them a million times. But there is some meat here that we can't browse over, that needs to have an an impact and an effect on our life. So let's talk about the first one. Salvation is not by physical birth. Salvation has nothing to do with who you were born to, has nothing to do with your physical birth. Now look how he explains this. Look at verse six. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Okay, so not everybody that's born an Israelite is a true Israelite. There is a true Israel inside of Israel. Then he says, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in who? Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, Abraham had many sons, right? And many sons had father Abraham. Do we need to stand up and sing that this morning? Again, okay. But Abraham, we all know he had one son that took a really, really long time for him to get here, Isaac. But he also had another son before Isaac. And what was his name? Ishmael was Abraham's son. He was the seed of Abraham. It would make perfect sense from a human standpoint that Ishmael would receive all of the blessings of the covenant. But that was not the case because the promise was not given to Hagar. The promise was given to Sarah. And you know what else about this promise? God waited all the way till Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. You seen a 90-year-old have a baby lately? Anybody in here seen that? (laughs) Could you imagine being a 90-year-old and having a baby? (laughs) No way. It was an absolute miracle of God because he's doing something greater and bigger. He's proving the point over and over again that salvation is completely His plan has nothing to do with any of us. Verses 8 through 9 reiterate this. Look at what he says in verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. There is the promise. And here's the whole point. Salvation has nothing to do with your physical birth. To the Jews specifically, this was a big deal because they were God's chosen people. And they thought automatically because they were born a Jew and because they were circumcised that they were okay and they were saved. And God's saying, no, 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 no. There's something bigger at stake here. Every single human being needs a savior. 
The same is true for us today. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter if your grandma went to church and she took you to church. It doesn't matter if your dad's a deacon or your dad's a pastor. None of that stuff matters. It has nothing to do with your birth. And can I just say, by the way, pray for your pastor's children. Just because they are growing up under that doesn't mean that they're automatically saved. And guess what? Our, our kids need prayers. You know what my son did to me a week ago or the last week we were here? You know those connection cards we ask you to fill out? They get read. They get prayed over. And my son, one of them, I won't tell you who, he wrote on there, prayer request, pray for my dad. He has issues with public speaking. <laughs> I'm like, what are, what are we doing here? My kids need the Lord. I'll tell you that right now. Pray for them. Pray for us. <laughs> Y'all understand the point? He's reiterating. Salvation has nothing to do with physical birth. Here's the second example that he uses. Salvation is not based on behavior. Now, this gets really interesting here. I, I, there's, some, there's some great things that are said in this passage. Hard to understand. Verse 10. And not only this, okay, not only does it have nothing to do with your birth, because Ishmael got passed over, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children who were Isaac and Rebekah's children, by the way, they had two twins and their names are, okay, say it a little bit louder, their names are Esau and Jacob, Jacob and Esau, okay? Technically, the birth order is Esau and Jacob, but I think I always say it, Jacob and Esau. How, uh, this was just interesting. How many of you were Jacob and Esau? How many of you were Esau and Jacob? Okay, just a few of you. I heard that a couple times right there. All right, that had nothing to do with anything. I was just curious, okay? <laughs> so the children, <laughs> Isaac and ja uh, Jacob and Esau. Isaac was their father. Look what it says in verse 10. The children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. This is the whole reason why this is the inspired word of God and why Paul is writing this. There is a phrase in there that the purpose of God according to election might stand. You know what that phrase means? Literally, the act of deliberately selecting someone or something. Before Jacob and Esau were ever born, before they ever had a chance to prove that they were good sons and obedient sons or that they were good Christians and faithful Christians, before they had a chance to even do anything at all, God in his sovereignty selected Jacob over Esau. Now this is going to hit home a whole lot more than Ishmael and Isaac because everybody knew that Hagar was not the chosen seed. And they looked at that as an illegitimate relationship even to begin with. Abraham should have never stepped out of the bounds of his marriage with Sarah. But now you're going to next level. Isaac is the chosen seed. And Isaac has, you would think that all of his children would be the promised ones. And he has two sons. And on top of that, they're twins. And on top of that, God chooses the younger one over the older one, which is absolutely almost unheard of in the history, especially of that day and time. It was always the oldest son that would get the benefits and the blessings of the covenant or the family, not the younger son. Now to back this up, Paul quotes two Old Testament verses. Look what he says in verse 12. Okay. It was said unto her, everybody read that next phrase out loud with me. The elder shall serve the younger. All right, so the elder shall serve the younger. We just got done talking about that. But you want to talk about a tough one? Look at verse 13. Let's all read this out loud. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. The main point is salvation is not of works. But you want to talk about the meat of God's word. How do you deal with a verse like that? Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, we're not going to dive far into this because all of the rest of Romans 9 next week is going to dive really far into that. But let me ask you a simple question on the surface. Did God really hate Esau? No, we know that that's not the case. For God so loved the world. He's not willing that any should perish, okay? God loves every single person. So what does he mean when he says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated? If you step, step away from that and you step into the New Testament, one of the things that Jesus told 
his followers, his disciples, he said this, unless you hate your father and your mother and your wife and your children and your brothers and your sisters, you cannot be my disciples. Now, when you get saved, does God want you to hate your mom and dad, your wife and your children and your brothers and sisters? Does he want you to do that? No, but when you get saved, what does he want? He wants Jesus over everything. He wants all of us. He wants complete surrender. So much so that if you were in a family that forced you to choose, it's either Christ or me, and you choose Christ, it could be taken as hatred to your dad or your mom or your brothers and sisters. That's what he's talking about here. It's not actually real legitimate Hatred, it's the fact that you love Christ so much that to somebody who doesn't have that same heart and that same spiritual understanding, it looks and it feels that way. In in a similar sense, that's what's happening here. God chose Jacob. Remember what we talked about in verse 4? God was going to, Jacob was going to receive all of the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, what God did for Jacob over Esau could easily make Esau look and feel like he was completely hated by God. And Jacob was loved by God because Jacob got everything and Esau (laughs) got nothing. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you that I have all the answers for this because there is a great mystery behind what is going on in this passage because salvation has everything to do with the sovereignty of God and his electing and his selecting and his choosing and his calling but there's also still a free will of man that is at play in all of this and that's why when Paul gets to the end of Romans chapter 11 he ends it and he says oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out some of this has to just be left alone to the fact that it is a mystery and it is about a God that is bigger and higher than us but here's the last practical application and we are done accept it there was an unfathomable rejection Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. I mean, the Jewish people rejected God. And here's the reality. When when we get down to this, we can start thinking, is God unrighteous? Is God not fair? And the reality is when it comes to salvation, we have to accept his ways and his plans, and we have to submit ourselves and believe that his way is perfect and his way is best. Did Esau get gypped? Did Esau get ripped off? I mean, Esau had no chance. On the surface, you know what it looks like? It sounds like Esau had no choice in the matter at all. He was destined for God's wrath before he was ever born. Now, here's the reality, though. Jacob and Esau, you and I, we still all have a choice, and we are responsible for our own decisions at the end of the day, no matter what. And guess what? Esau still chose. And you know what the Bible tells us? That he despised his birthright. You know what that means? He looked at his family. He looked at his grandpa, Abraham. He said, you know what? These guys are talking about this promise. God's going to make of thee a great nation. He couldn't even, Sarah couldn't even have a baby. She was 90 years old. He's looking at his mom and dad, and he's saying, my mom and dad had a long time having, had a hard time having children. They had to wait 20 years after they got married before they had a child. And, And here they are, they're in the third generation, and there's Two guys that are going to carry on this promise. And you know what Esau could be thinking? Birthright, great nation. Maybe they're a little bit delusional. Maybe there's not as much going on here as what they think is going on here. And he hated his birthright. And he was willing to sell it for a measly meal when he was hungry because he despised it. And I say all of that to say Esau chose. And he was responsible for the decisions that he made. And all of this culminates in the fact that no one will ever enter hell and say, I didn't deserve this. No one is ever going to enter hell and say, I did not deserve this judgment and this punishment because we are sinners. And when you stand before God, it will be revealed and you will know it. And everybody has a choice in the matter. Let's flip the coin real quick. Did Jacob deserve it? How many of you think Jacob deserved it? 
Did he deserve the covenant and the blessings and the promise? How many of you say a big, fat? Okay, good. Yeah, let's do that again. Did Jacob deserve it? No. No way. (laughs) Oh, this is so good. (sighs) It sounds like Jacob didn't have any choice in the matter either, right? Before he was even born. Before he had a chance to do anything right or anything wrong. God, in his sovereignty, selected and chose the younger one. And he said, it's not going to be Esau and Jacob both. It's going to be Jacob. And I'm going to choose him. And it has absolutely nothing to do with anything that he does or who he is as a person. Because, by the way, Jacob was a deceiver. He was a pretty messed up person. He did a lot of of really messed up things in his life, okay? That's who Jacob was. But he was destined for God's unconditional blessings before he was ever born. But you know what? Jacob still had to choose. And he had to choose to act in obedience to the faith. And as imperfect as Jacob was, he saw the birthright. And he saw the promises. And he saw the blessings. And he said, I want that. And in his very broken and imperfect way, he pursued that and he believed God by faith. And as a result, God was good and gracious and merciful to him. And God poured out all the blessings of the covenant upon him in an incredible way. And you know what all of that has to do with us? There will be no one, no one who ever steps foot into heaven who says, I did deserve this. No, every single one of us, when we enter into eternity in heaven, we will fall on our face and we will say, only by God's goodness, only because he chose me before I was ever born, only because he called me in spite of my, only because he opened up my blinded eyes so that I could see, it's only by his grace and only by his mercy that I am here. And can I tell you this morning, there's not a better way to start 2024 than with this perspective. God, help us to climb to the top of that mountain. We just got done with Christmas. We just got done with Romans chapter 8. The blessings, securities, assurances, gifts, everything that you have in Christ, it's real and it will never ever be taken away from you. Accept it. Child of God, do you believe it? Do you believe that you're more than a conqueror? Do you believe there's no more condemnation? Do you believe that all things will work together for good? Do you believe nothing can ever separate you from the love of God? Do you feel the glory and the weight of the fact that I am saved and I am redeemed and I'm a child of God? Man, we got to get a hold of that because when we do and when we're sitting there at the feet of Jesus, when we're singing in church about forever he is glorified, then at the same time, we'll look at the lost world around us and it will hit us with every fiber of our being. That there are people out there who need Jesus. We need to start this year with worship. We need to start this year on our knees, thanking God and getting overwhelmed once again that our salvation had nothing to do with us, but in his goodness and his mercy, long before we were ever born, he said, I'm going to choose you. Wow. And to the person here this morning, that doesn't know God. Accept him. He's calling you. There's a call that is going out. And the choice is yours. Next week we're going to talk about vessels of wrath that are fitted for destruction. Not everyone in this world gets saved. That was part of God's plan from the beginning. But that doesn't mean he's not calling you today. That doesn't mean he's not standing here pleading with you saying, I love you. I went to a cross for you. There's no greater life that you could ever have than the life that I want to give you. Turn your life and turn it to Jesus. Choose Jesus over everything. Set aside whatever those weights are that are holding you back. Set aside your doubts. Set aside your your fears. Put your faith in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross and give your life to him and repent and believe and be saved. And don't look at Christianity and don't look at God's word and despise it and say, oh, those are just people that need a crutch. No, God will sovereignly in his power change every single thing about your life if you accept the call and if you believe it.